What is going on, everybody? Welcome to yet another episode of The Rose Show. As always, I am your host, Jay. Who else but me? And today, my guest is comedian Sam Miller. Uh, Got a lot of respect for this guy, not only for his hustle and, and how hard this guy works, But for the simple fact of he is one of the most down to earth individuals, Um, I am I contacted him about doing this uh, interview and immediately he was like, yeah, here's my phone number. Let's talk. I was like, wow, no negotiation, no nothing. He just wants to get his get his name out there. And man, it's, it's so cool to see somebody out there with that kind of a drive where it's like, no matter what, I'm going to get this done. So, uh, like I said, a lot of respect for him. Very funny dude. Uh, Bob and Tom show veteran, obviously, which is how I heard of him. And, um, why one of the reasons why I really wanted to get him on here today, because I am, as you know, if you've been watching the show for any time period, uh, you know, I'm a big Bob and Tom show fan and, uh, have been for years. So it's, it's so fucking cool to, to have guys like this on this show. And, um, and, and be able to talk to people that I have discovered myself through the Bob and Tom show. So um, anyway, I am not going to take up too much more of your time. I'm really excited to jump into this episode. So let's go ahead and do it. Uh, After a word from my sponsors, let's go ahead and do it. All right, everybody, it's time to stop and let you know about today's sponsor of the show, Crazy Martins in Piqua, Ohio, one of my favorite places in the entire world to go to. Crazy Martins has provided their customers with quality products for over 20 years, from ashtrays to water pipes and everything in between. Stop in, check out their selection, and of course, check out their pinball machines. With over 20 pins to choose from, there is something for everyone. Crazy since 1996. I don't just say this about every place. I love going to Crazy Martins. I've always loved going to Crazy Martins ever since I was of age to go to Crazy Martins. It's one of my favorite places in the entire world. Me and my wife go there almost every Sunday to play pinball machines. It is one of the funnest spots in Ohio you could possibly find. It is in Pickle, Ohio. Check out their website at www.crazymartins.com. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to yet another episode of The Rose Show. As always, I'm your host, Jay. Who else but me? And today, my guest has a very unique story. Um, I first heard him on The Bob and Tom Show not that long ago. Um, I, I live in Dayton, Ohio, for those who don't know. So, like, this is a Bob and Tom hub, you know? So, um, I, when I heard you, it, it was one of the f- episodes that I've actually gone back and added to my favorites um, and listened to multiple times before in the past. And yeah, like I said, he just got such a unique story of, of how he came into comedy. And uh, he's somebody that I think has a bright future ahead of him. He is comedian Sam Miller, my friend. How are we doing today? Uh, I'm doing good. I'm getting over a little sickness right now. So, uh, uh-huh. yeah, I just actually just started feeling better this morning. So I've been kind of in a in a loop. But I'm doing good though. Good, 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 good. Now, this isn't anything that I wanted to talk about today since you brought it up. Is that kind of common for comedians to get sick? Because you guys are typically traveling from state to state and you're yeah. meeting all different kinds of people who probably don't wash their hands. Yeah. When COVID first came around and um kind of before stuff shut down, we were the first ones that were getting it a lot of the times. Mm. I was actually up north in Washington State, one of the some of the first cases were in Washington state up North and um, yeah, a lot of us got it really early and yeah, yeah, we get sick a lot. It sucks. It's part of the deal. So yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. Well, um, what I kind of wanted to talk to you about today is just kind of getting your overall backstory because while I didn't obviously, like I said, enjoyed you on the Bob and Tom show and all that, yeah, it's not really the kind of environment that you could sit down and have in depth talks. And um, so I kind of wanted to try that with you here a little bit today and just kind of get your overall background. And, and um, you know, obviously we'll cover the obvious stuff, but you know, what was a, what was a then a little Sam Miller like growing up, man, it was, uh, I was kind of a mess. I was a, I was a messy kid uh, in a messy house in a messy neighborhood. Uh, my dad passed away when I was really young. I was 12 when my dad passed away. Um, he was really strict. My mom wasn't. Um, things things were already off the rails before I was 12. And then when my dad when my dad died, it just everything went everything went wild. And then uh, I was off to the races. You know, uh, I was uh, 
I've always had like what you call like ADHD real bad. And so um, I, I struggled in school. Um, every once in a while, I'd have something I was into and I would do really, really well. But most of the time, I just thought it was boring and stupid and I just didn't do it. And I knew I was going to get in trouble, but I just didn't care. So I just didn't do it. <laughs> so That's fair enough. That's fair enough. So did you always have kind of like a comedic side to you growing up, even when you were little? Or was like, um, you said, obviously, you've had kind of like a trouble upbringing and all that kind of stuff. Did you use, you know, a, a funny personality to kind of cope with that? Because I know a lot of guys who did. Yeah, I, I wanted to. I wanted to be funny. But when I was a kid, like I was I was like a wannabe class clown. Like, I think I just made people uncomfortable most of the time because I couldn't get like jokes to hit and stuff like that. It was yeah. really strange. I didn't actually become like funny until kind of later in life, you know, kind of kind of figuring it out, figuring out how people work and what makes people laugh. And uh but yeah, I, I was I was definitely like attention starved. I would do all kinds of stuff for attention. Some of it was really bad. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> right, right. Um, so for those that don't know, you're a big dude. You're yeah. six six. What is it? Six six three sixty. Is that right? Yeah, three seventy. But who's counting? You know, three seventy. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. What what's ten pounds when you're when yeah. you're that big? Yeah. And for did did you? And this is only something I could talk about with a fellow tall guy because I'm six foot three. So I'm I'm yeah. quite tall myself. Uh not obviously not near your height, but did you grow up like were were you one of those people that were big over a summer like me? Because it I was five six one summer, and then by the time it started the next school year, I was six foot tall. So in a span of three months, I shot up that fast. Yeah. Did you did you experience that as well? Yeah, I hit like three puberties is what happened. So <laughs> I was just like I just got carried away. Um I don't know. I I I the story I always tell folks, I remember um I knew I was bigger than a lot of my classmates. Mm -hmm. And then I remember I was laying on my mom's couch. I must have been like sixteen or seventeen. And I remember looking down at my feet and just being like, Holy crap, like those are so far away. <laughs> like, <laughs> and like, like actually realizing it because, you know, when you're in your own body, like it doesn't like, right. I've always just been this big, like I'm just used to not fitting places and uh, just dealing with it. So yeah, it wasn't like one, I really mean it. Like it was like a few different growth spurts and uh, yeah. yeah, it was strange, man. Yeah. For me, it, it Nobody believed me, and I didn't know what was happening to me, but I ended up being diagnosed with Osgood slaughters, which is a condition to where your bones are growing faster than your muscles. Oh, and sure. everybody thought everybody thought I was um, making it up. Well, not everybody, but my, my, my dad was when it first started happening. I was staying with my dad down in Florida, and just out of nowhere, like my knee just started hurting. It felt like I got Nancy Kerrigan in my fucking knee. Oh, like it was wild. And, but, and he thought I was making it up because it was literally out of nowhere, right? And then a couple mm -hmm. more times it happens, and eventually I had to go to a doctor about it. And they were like, yeah, this is actually a condition. It it will end up, you know, evening itself out. But it's so crazy how, you know, shit like that, uh, shit like that happens. But anyway, I, I don't get these conversations with tall people very often. So I had to at least throw that in there in my own no, podcast. Sure. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but um, so growing up, did you have any... Did you have deep roots in comedy uh, as far no. as like your interest, your interest go? You weren't interested at all in comedy when you were younger? I mean, I saw stand up sometimes, you know, I used to watch Comic View actually. And like, uh, yeah, because we didn't have for some reason, my friend Ricky, uh, he, I didn't have cable, but my friend Ricky had cable. And for some reason he had BET, but he didn't have Comedy Central. So like we would watch it sometimes. I remember seeing like Chris Tucker and like, uh. Mm -hmm stuff like that and then um watching like sam i i mean i got into like some sam kinnison stuff i remember i don't know how i got my hands on it but i got my hands on like some sam kinnison vhs tape and um i think i just liked that he yelled all the time i thought that was really funny but stand-up comedy like i mean comedy as a whole like i was into like funny movies like yeah, I guess probably my big, you know, I, I, I usually it's probably Chris Farley and like Adam Sandler and stuff like that. Like I watched a lot of man, a lot of Adam Sandler movies, a lot of Chris Farley stuff. You know, that was a lot yeah. of 
the humor back then, like Happy Gilmore and Billy Madison and Waterboy and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. And then obviously like Chris Farley, like Tommy Boy, still one of my favorite movies. Um, yes. Uh, every once in a while I get compared to Chris Farley and it makes me really happy. So um, <laughs> you wouldn't know it right now, but a lot of times like I get really worked up. Like I, I have a lot of energy. Um, but like I said, I'm still kind of getting over the sickness right now. So I'm kind of like low energy right now. So Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's so crazy because I first started getting into comedy when a uh, BT comic view would come around as well. Um, here in here locally uh, at Kings Island, which is the closest spot, you know, uh, theme park wise to where I live, they would play clips of comic view. And um, so I was I saw it on BET one night and then I ended up having these VHS tapes that <laughs> I'm dating myself here, but I would record certain comedians yeah. and make like my own mixtapes almost. Oh, nice. Yeah. And, uh, I, I, that's how I got hip to Cat Williams, number one. I first saw Cat Williams on Comic View for the first time ever. And then when he was on that, uh, what was it, Friday After Next, I was like, whoa, shit, I know that guy. Lavelle Crawford, first saw him on Comic View. Shang, first saw, saw him on Comic View. Yeah. Steve Byrne, first saw him on Comic View. The amount of careers that show watched, oh, or yeah. that, that show launched, is insane. And I know, like, speaking of cat williams he said in the interview he did with shannon sharp that he felt like comic view kind of hurt comedy because everyone got a standing ovation does that do you feel that way now that you're kind of into business as well i don't know man i think that all this stuff is going to come in cycles you know right now kill tony is really hot and uh eventually that'll fade away and something else will will come up i mean like for a while everybody was talking about dry bar and then uh I don't know. I think um, I do. I do think about it because it's important for me to try to to try to figure it out as best I can. But yeah. uh, I kind of I kind of just keep my head down. And because one thing that is true about comedy now is that um, anymore, you just have to do it yourself, like getting mm-hmm. on. Um, you know, I know a lot of folks that have like TV credits. And I get, I get more work than they do because I have like a social media following, you know, and yeah, uh, right. I'm willing to, um, and like this podcast, like I pretty much just say yes to everything. Um, I don't, you know, I, I, uh, if people want to talk to me about comedy, I'm there, you know? And, uh, but yeah, I don't know the the industry is always changing, but it's always, you know, comedy more than everything, the more than a lot of things is still a meritocracy. So because it's like it's like boxing or sports where um you can run your mouth all you want but then when you're when you're up on that stage um the the truth is going to come out you know like there's no there's no faking um you can't you can't like if somebody doesn't know what they're doing they're just not going to kill you know and uh i take a lot of pride in that man is it like uh i'm still catching up with the business side of things but um, I'm very confident in my in my comedy and my in my my act and um, how I'm doing things. So. Yeah, yeah. And it, I come from a background of music. That's the majority of of my life has been music. And um, the last ten years before COVID, when I was in a band, it was the exact same way. You're not just going up to a microphone and singing live. You're not just recording in a studio. You have to learn how to do Photoshop. And you have to learn how to oh, yeah. properly edit edit videos, which is how you know this podcast here in general you can go through any one of my episodes and there's an intro video there's edited stuff i mean there's music background it's not just a simple press play hey here's an interview i learned all that yeah. to do this while doing music and it's crazy how everything now when it comes to people people don't really i, I don't think see just how we're at the end of the production company era. You know, record labels are no yeah. longer going. Ten years from now, record labels aren't going to matter. And if you, you know, Jelly Roll is a prime example of that. I Jelly Roll was doing shows with me ten years ago, and now this dude is one of the biggest, you know, country acts in the world, and he does it all himself. He doesn't do it with a production company. Same thing with you. You know, you got to do your own booking. You got to, you know, on yeah. top of the art, on top of the art. So, yeah, that's that's a real good point. Um, so. This was something I wanted to talk about later, but since we're here, we might as well. When it comes to 
going back to the Cat Williams thing and what he said on Shannon Sharp's interview, I asked this to Greg Hahn when I talked to him not that long ago. And I kind of want to get your opinion on it as well, because obviously, you know, there are levels to the comedy game as far as exposure as there are with anything else, right? Music, yeah. professional wrestling, whatever it is. Every every form of entertainment has levels to the exposure. The level that you're on right now, which I would say rising star, I think would be the, the proper way to put the level that you're on. Do you find that there's a lot of butting heads with other comedians or do you think it's more of uh more of a camaraderie or is it just competitive because greg Hahn gave me the answer of just he don't he doesn't pay attention to it but it is there on the level that he's in where it's like everybody's trying to cut each other's throat to get the next gig do you find that to be the case in your uh level that you're on of rising star you know i probably fall in line with kind of what greg said where um okay yeah, that, that is going on, and there is, like, a lot of competition. But also, um, I just kind of do my own thing. Like, I'll, I'll see I'll – I'll be on Instagram or something, and I'll see – I'll be like, oh, this person is doing this, or this person is doing that. Um, but I've learned over – you know, I've learned through pain and, like, the, the, uh, like most lessons – um, have been very painful in this industry. Um, that it really doesn't matter what anybody's doing. Um, I can't, um, all I can do is me and I have, and as the thing with me is that I've built up my own following and it's a passionate following. And, uh, and like, I am doing stuff on the national level now. Um, and it's hard because like, sometimes people just don't come out. Like I don't get people out to shows like I thought I can or, Right. But then there's other times where I get way more people than I thought I would. And, uh, but at any time, anytime I want to, I can just come back to the Northwest and do my thing out here. People don't realize that, but I've been headlining for like five or six years, you know, like, Oh I've really? Been, wow. Yeah. Yeah. But in the Northwest, you know, cause I didn't work. There's really, I had a, I have issues with like comedy clubs and stuff like that. I think they're fine. And I don't think there's any, it just, it just isn't a good fit for me sometimes because like, I don't really want to play the game. I don't really want to wait my turn. I don't really want to like, they, you, you, you know, you get in like the host rotation and then you like, you host for like a year and then, and then every couple months you get to like, you might get like a hosting spot or something. And then eventually you get to start featuring and I'm good on that. Like I just started doing my own thing. Like I would produce my own shows and work directly with venues and yeah. Yeah. I kind of, I kind of lost my ass sometimes, but overall I think it worked, but maybe it was, it's probably a little bit more painful to do it the way I did it, but um, I don't regret nothing, you know, like uh, I think that I'm like ahead of the game now. There's a lot of comics, you know, I'm coming up June will be 10 years. I've been doing stand up. And uh, I'm in a really good place right now. And, you know, I'm grateful. So, yeah. And I, we uh, here in Dayton, we've got a funny bone and another uh, club called Wiley's, um, oh, yeah. which a lot of Bob, a lot of Bob and Tom acts go to Wiley's quite a bit. Um, and I honestly prefer Wiley's because it's not, God, this is going to sound so hipster. Wiley's isn't as corporate comedy as funny bone is. And again, I understand how hipster that sounds, but let me explain for those who might not really understand what I mean. You said you don't want to do like the whole hosting thing, right? Yeah, yeah. I got to be completely honest. Whenever I the host is on and they're talking about, we've got comic cards down here and it's the same speech every time. This is you. all you just did was just take me out of the moment. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's it's so tough to be in an environment like that as a fan. I can't even imagine what what it's like, you know, for someone like you. You just said, you know, exactly how I feel on the fan side. It's just, oh, God, it's so hard to sit through. And like I said, I'd rather go to a Wiley's just because it's more laid back. You know, there's there's stand up comedy is is so hard at at a certain level. Um, You know, you you start out hosting and you're like, oh, man, I wish I could. I wish I just had a great five minutes. You get to a point where you get that five minutes. And then it's like, oh, man, I wish I could feature. And you get to a spot where you can do your 15, 20, 30 or whatever. And then you get to a spot where you start headlining. And then you realize, like, 
every jump in time that you're doing, um, it, it, I feel like it gets like a magnitude, like harder. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then you look around at the people that started doing comedy with you and, um, that most people quit, um, they can't hang. And, uh, a lot of people, they, they get stuck in this like cycle of like, of, of self doubt and, uh, self doubt, like this, and this repetition where they kind of work the same rooms in the same way. And they're constantly second guessing themselves and their material. Um, they keep, they keep cutting it back to square one, you know, and, and start again. Yeah. And then the other thing that is difficult right now too, I don't know how much this pertains to your question, but, uh, there's this thing that's happening in comedy right now. And I think a lot of it has to do with kill Tony where, um, folks are just doing very bombastic, like stuff on stage where they are for, for those who don't know, would you explain what kill Tony is? Uh, it's this thing in Austin with Tony Hinchcliffe and, um, and they, uh, have people do one minute of stand up, usually open micers. And then okay. they, they talk about it. Uh, I don't know. I don't really watch it. Uh, I see the clips online, Okay, <laughs> but what happens, um, the kind of comedy that's coming out of that ethosphere right now is um, very offensive, very, and, you know, and comedy has a place for that. I can agree that like comedy should be offensive sometimes, you know, Sure. Um, yeah. but you have to, you have to do it for a reason. And um, man, it's like a race to the bottom. I used to get really, I used to get really nervous with comedians from LA because yeah. they would have these habits where they would be like so wild, you know, like so, so really? Yeah, yeah. Because they're trying to stand out. Like there's, there's just too many people, you know. And now it's Texas, specifically Austin, that I get worried about. If I have a comedian tell me they're from Austin, Texas, um, mm. I get worried. I get worried, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I, I completely agree with you. I'm of the mindset of. I don't always prefer offensive comedy, but I definitely think there is a need for it. However, there is a line, you know, at some point where it's just like, okay, case in point, I don't know. I'm sure you probably heard of him. There's a comedian named John Valby. And uh, if you've never heard of John Valby, he is intentionally disgusting at all times. I don't yeah. even, I'm not even, the only reason why I'm saying his name is because he's an example. I don't recommend looking this guy up, but for me, I prefer more of the lines of a Dave Chappelle. That's what I grew up on the Chappelle show. I can yeah. quote you anything. I could give you the entire Samuel Jackson beer stick right now. And I, I watched it, you know, mainly in high school. And, um, you know, I, that's the kind of comedy that I prefer where it's still funny, but it's not like hitting you where it really hurts, yeah. you know? And that's, I, there's definitely a line there, but so when it comes to, how you started, I guess. Uh, I guess we're going to hit the reset button here for a minute. How did you get to a point where it was like, you know what? I'm funny. I'm going to I'm gonna try my hand at comedy. People told me I should do it for a long time. People told me I should do stand-up. And um, they, I don't know. I was just, I was, I was funny before I did comedy. And I was already doing like public speaking stuff with uh, recovery stuff. And uh yeah. And then one day I walked down the street and I saw an open mic and I don't know, it was just a whim. I didn't even know it was happening that night. And I just went for it. And there was a guy named Devin for real. who was a really funny comedian in Olympia back in the day. And yeah, uh, yeah dude, I killed. I did really good. Well, I mean, I didn't kill, but I was like, I did. I did well, you know, especially for out the gate. And uh, and after that, it was off to the races. So I never, I never looked back. And my first thought when I got off stage, I always tell people the story. I don't know if people believe me or not, but my first thought when I got off stage was like, oh shit, I'm going to get divorced because, um, I thought <laughs> like it was so, you know, I had, my kids are 10 and 13 now. And so this is 10 years ago. So I had like a, a three-year-old and like a six month old at home and, right. uh, dude, um, I'm lucky. 
I'm lucky that it worked out. So, and it, it was, it was this constant balancing act because there was no money for like three or four years. There's just like no money. Every once in a while I'd land a gig that would pay decent, but, um, pretty much nothing, you know? And, uh, yeah, yeah. That's how it started. Did you have stuff that you were rehearsing in your head before you went up on stage? Cause no, or I just you, told it. You just I, went up. No, there's a story. I mean, there's stories that you tell, you know. Um, I told a story that I tell a lot of times. I, I told this story about one time I was drunk and I was making a cup of noodle at my mom's house. And I shut the tip of my dick in a silverware drawer. And uh, I told that story. And it just, dude, it's a true story. Like, it hurt so bad. It made me, like, pass out. It was weird. It was like I got electrocuted. It didn't even hurt my dick. It just, like, hurt everything. Yeah. It was right. crazy. Yeah. So I told that story. And then, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I kept doing that, too. It's so funny because, like, when you first start going, right? So, like, I was like, all right, I got five, you know, like, I would go out the gate. I'm like, okay, I got this three-minute long story. And while I'm up there, like, I know how to make people pay attention. Like, I was like, okay, so this is a story. I got to add all, you got to add in all these little details and get little laughs until you get to the end of the story. And then that became the blueprint for everything moving forward. So like when I have an idea, like, um, like I've been working on this thing and I talked about it on Bob and Tom about falling out of the tree. I was going to ask you about that next. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So like, so like that was something that I talked about, um, in recovery with people for a long time, you know, cause it's a really good, like, it's a really good analogy for alcoholism, you know, well, it's not really an analogy cause this shit happened, but like, um, right, yeah. it was, it was par for the course for me back then. And so what I'm doing now is right now, it's probably like a two minute long story. And I just kind of put it in the middle of my set sometimes, but then yeah. I'll keep finding stuff. I'll keep adding stuff, you know, like I talk about how that girl, uh, there's that girl and I, you know, I owed her money and I knew she couldn't get up the tree, you know, so making jokes about that, you know, and then, uh, before you know it, you know, it's a joke, dude, you know? Right. Can you tell the story about you falling out of the tree? Because I think I, I want to follow up on that specific story after you, you tell it. Yeah. So I was at a, I was at a party, you know, I always joke that, um, I wasn't the kind of drunk you would want inside your house. I was more of like an outdoors drunk. Like the only safe place for me to drink was like in the woods. Cause I couldn't like knock over trees or whatever. Um, but yeah, I was out at this party, um, having a bonfire or whatever. And, uh, this girl Cameron showed up. Uh, I owed her 20 bucks and I had 20 bucks, but I didn't want to pay her cause I had other plans for that money, you know? And, uh, <clears throat> so I grabbed the six pack and I climbed up a tree cause I knew she couldn't get up there. And, uh, I, uh, I don't remember much else. I remember going up the tree, but I was already really drunk when I went up the tree. And then, um, yeah, I woke up in the hospital, uh, doctor who knew me, you know, it's always a bad sign. He goes, Sam, um, he goes, uh, I think it's time that you make a change. I mean, I think this is evidence of like how your life is falling apart. And I think it's time you make a change. And I was like, I was like, yeah, it's like, I, I gotta, I gotta quit climbing trees. You know, like I had a tree problem. You know? <laughs> That's what it is, man. Yeah. But the reason why that story stuck with me <coughs> is because it is, what is a deep joke when you really think about it? And like you said, the minds, the mindset of addiction, I have a cousin and this is public knowledge. It's not like I'm diming in a mouth, but I have a cousin who I always kind of looked at as a little brother. And I had to, I had to stop associating with him about eight years ago because he just, he knew he was not a drinker. His father had issues with alcohol. Same thing with his mother. His mother had problems with drugs, but luckily he never got that deep into it. And he very similar kind of mindset of, man, I got so drunk last night. I let, uh, uh, we were, I was letting you punch me in my stomach. 
Next time, I should just stop letting you punch me in my stomach. That's a real story. Yeah, Not, yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. maybe I shouldn't get so fucking drunk that I've got my hands above my head, like punch me as hard as you can. And that that wasn't the problem, or you know, it wasn't the drinking yeah. that got him there. It was the fact he had his hands above his head. And so when I hear stuff like that, I think, man, that is such a. And for those who don't know, I guess we kind of skimmed over this. For those who don't know, your story of recovery comes from a place of drug abuse and homelessness yeah it was um, bad man yeah um yeah, I, it, yeah i don't i don't know you know i i think about this because people ask me and i i don't really know the answer completely but there was a because you know people don't realize that like homelessness is on like a spectrum right so like uh living in houses without water and power you know or living in my car or living in a tent right. or living um living on couches, living on porches. Like I've, I've just lived a lot of different places and um, sometimes I lived outside and uh, yeah. yeah. And it was due for a lot of folks. They're just kind of, they're kind of born into it. But me, I had to, I had to work really hard to get, to get that low. So yeah, uh, yeah. it was wild, man. Yeah. Well, uh, the first time I heard you, like I said in the intro, was the Bob and Tom Show. Again, gigantic fan of the Bob and Tom Show. Always have been uh, for the last, well, I should say always, probably about the last 20 years or so. Nice. Um, I, but but they've always been a part of my life, even when I wasn't a, 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 an avid listener, because they were just on in this area from pretty much day one. Um, we had the old Pinkley Taurus uh, albums, if you remember those. That goes way back to like late 90s and stuff. So they've always been a part of my life. But like I said, the last 20 years, I've been a big fan. I got a chance to see him at their live show here in Dayton, Ohio, uh, last July. Literally one of the 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 funnest moments of my life being in the crowd for that. So I, I, I always wonder as a performer myself, granted I was in music, not comedy. But as a performer myself, I always wonder what it was like to, you know, experience something like that. Yeah. And obviously you have, you have. And uh, uh, before I ask you what, uh, how you got onto the show, I just wanted to tell a quick story of, as a, a listener, um, I always obviously listen while I'm at work. We're allowed to listen to, to earbuds at work and I'm listening to you for the first time on the show. And Tom's talking about your abuse issues. And, uh, you know, he says, uh, so you're a former addict and you go, yeah, yeah. And he he goes, what was your drink of choice? And you go, meth. And yeah, dude, yeah. I literally, I yeah. laughed so hard. Guys were coming around the corner to see what was going on, right? Yeah. That's how hard I was laughing at that moment. At that point, I was like, oh, this guy's the shit. And, and again, I listen to that episode quite frequently. But how how did you get on to the Bob and Tom show? Were you invited? Did you have to contact them? Or how did dude, that work for you? You wouldn't believe it, man. It's such a weird story. So it actually it actually started because believe it or not i was doing a i was doing a i had a show this is going to be a really long story i hope you're ready i had a show no, go in, right ahead i had a show in um this southern illinois um and then i had a show in traverse city michigan and uh my first show was on a thursday uh, my second show was on a sunday so i had friday and saturday off and so i went to chicago for a couple days and uh while i was there i managed to get a guest i managed to get a spot at the laugh factory in chicago and mm. um <laughs> on the late late show so it's a saturday it starts at like 11 the show doesn't i didn't go on stage until like 1 30 in the morning and usually Damn. that's the last spot you want is to be on the last spot on the last show it's if people are tired and drunk but man, like I was ready. I had a really good set. I was really excited. There was a hot crowd. And um, basically the bartender there, this guy, Joe, um, he really liked my stuff. And then he talked to, um, he talked to the guy who books the Laugh Factory, um, this guy, Curtis. And he said that he wanted me to come for a whole week. So I did like a residency at the Laugh Factory in Chicago. So I did a whole week of shows. You get like a thousand bucks for the whole week every night doing a show, you know, except for, um, on Thursday, there was this headliner that came in and he had his own feature and I hosted the first show, but then I was like, you know, I'm just going to go do my own thing, man. There was no, it wasn't like any drama or anything like that. I just, I just kind of wanted to go. And it turns out there was this weird house show called the Humboldt jungle. I went to that show, had a really good set. It was like my kind of crowd and that video. So it turns out they took video at that show they posted it on their Instagram 
It also went onto their Facebook page. They didn't even know it was going to their Facebook page. They didn't pay attention to mm. Facebook because they're 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 twenty something, so they could care less about Facebook. And right. uh, anyway, that that they on the Facebook right. All of a sudden, I'm literally at I was at Legoland with the family, and I got a message, and it was like, "Hey, dude, I just saw that video. It's crazy, bro. It's blowing up." And I was like, "What are you talking about?" He's like, and he sent me a link. And it was me telling a joke about being a semi truck, having sex with my wife. And um, it was already when they sent me the link, it was already at 3 million views. And then uh, by 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 the next day, it was seven, seven million. And then it wound up, I think it's at eight and a half is where it sits now. And uh, anyway, uh, <coughs> Willie Griswold. Um, does a lot of comedy in Chicago and, um, his friend is the one who books that weird underground show and, um, Willie and, um, and Jess, um, uh, they were sending my videos back and forth. And one day I got a message asking if I was willing to come on and, um, I'll be honest, like I'm from the Northwest. And so like Bob and Tom, like I'd heard of it and I know. Yeah. I knew that they had broken a lot of comedians and stuff like that. Um, I wasn't so familiar with it though. And, uh, but I, right. w- I watched some clips and stuff and I was like, yeah, this would be great. And then sure enough, I just, I had an, a Midwest run coming up and um, I, I just flew into Indianapolis a couple days early and went on the show. The show is the first time I did it. I was really nervous. Um, that's what's funny is because when you, when you talk about that chunk with Tom, so like, first off, like I got, I sat right next to Josh Arnold. Right. And then even before the, even before the show started, me and Josh were kind of talking back and forth and dude, it takes me like, man, if I have somebody talk to me for five seconds, I I can tell if they're like, if they're a professional stand up comedian or not, there's a way we carry ourselves in a way that we talk. You know, um, you get so used to word economy. Like, I don't waste any words. Like, I can be long winded, but every word I use is there for a reason. And right. um, anyway, I'm talking to talking to Josh before the mics start, and then that immediately calmed me down. And then, luckily, when um, and once I calmed down, then Tom started asking me that question. You know, about like what my favorite night it was. It was in the chamber before he finished. Like, I didn't plan on saying that. I didn't know he was going to ask that question. But I was like, uh, you know, because another part of it, too, man, is it like I don't have like a like a fuck you attitude or nothing. But right. also, I'm not going to pretend like that I'm ashamed of stuff that I'm not, dude. Like, like, yeah, there's stuff that I'm not proud of. But like, like to me, like being a drug addict isn't something to be ashamed of. It's something that you can work on, you know, like shame doesn't do shame doesn't do anything at all. And, right. um, I think that's one of the reasons why my comedy career is going so well is because there's a lot of people that maybe if they haven't experienced it themselves, everybody knows somebody who's been through it. So. No. Okay. Well, um, as we wind down here, uh, I would just want to say, man, uh, you're, you're one of my favorite, uh, favorite comedians coming up in, in the game. Um, I personally, enjoy your honesty and i think it's refreshing i uh i i think that there is a lot of um there's a lot of healing in traumatic humor humor and yeah. uh it comes off it comes off well you know with 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 guys like you so uh nothing but all the success in the world for you i always give the last couple of minutes to my guest uh at the end of this to see if there's anything they'd like to plug whether it be socials how to look you uh look up your schedule yeah. and all that so floor is yours yeah sam miller sam miller comedy on facebook that's like my biggest one um i've done really you know a lot of people it's funny people don't like uh they, like i have a weird I I always feel like I got to say this because for somebody who makes their living doing it, like on a, on a lot of levels, like I absolutely despise social media. Um, Mm. but it has helped my career a great deal. So it's like, um, because it's weird because Facebook and Instagram, they want me to make content for them. Meta wants me to make content. They pay me to make content. I get, um, I get money every month from Meta. Um, 
and I want people to come to shows. They want people to stay home and to watch ads. Um, so we're in this dance, but yeah, Sam Miller comedy on Facebook, <coughs> Sam Miller comedian on Instagram, um, Sam Miller comedian on TikTok, and Sam Miller Um, yeah. And also, you know, what's funny is, uh, I'm going to look up this Wiley's comedy club. I'm going to try to come out there. So. Bro, if you are, I, you have my word. Me and my wife will be there. So <laughs> if be you awesome, do, dude. yeah, yes, I will be front row. Absolutely, that'd be great. That'd be great. So yes, yeah, sir. thanks for doing this, Jay. Man, it was really cool. Yeah, thank you for being on, my man. It's been a pleasure.